you know, law is kind of the software that society runs on, right? I mean, it is the, the engine for deciding stuff that we have to decide. The more genuine you are and the more that you think about basing your content off of human interaction, the better it'll be. Things that would take computers until the heat death of the universe to solve will just be cracked instantaneously. Oh my God, it's going to be a mess. I can't wait. We have with us in the studio today information technology law librarian Jason Tubinis. In addition to his duties as a law librarian, Jason also contributes to the IT services team with Leslie and I and helped to inform decisions about new software and technology used here at the law school and law library. Along with law librarian Maureen Cahill, Jason has co-taught law school courses about legal technology. Welcome, Jason. Hi there. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for being here. And what was covered in your legal technology course? The legal technology course is more of a survey, I'd like to think. Uh, it's just one credit hour, so you can't get really in-depth into one or a couple aspects of legal technology. So it's covering all of the things a new attorney entering the field would have to know about. So from the basics of productivity software, how to manage email appropriately, all the way up to, I just got served with a notice that I need to provide a couple databases worth of information to the e-discovery person. How do I manage that process? Uh, what is LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer and how is, are those services going to affect my practice? So a little bit of everything. You just mentioned a couple of programs that that future lawyers may be using. Can you tell us like some of the technology that you see um, lawyers today using in the field? There is so much out there and it's, I can answer that by answer that question by talking about two separate kind of areas where technology is having the biggest impact on the practice of law. There's technology that um, kind of impacts the the practice of law. This is actually doing the things that lawyers are trained to do. And those technologies, those pieces of software are pretty straightforward when you start listing them out. It's the productivity software. It's how to use Microsoft Word really efficiently. It's using Outlook uh, and employing all of the tools that it has kind of baked in, but is hiding just one level under the surface. It's you know, how to manage PDFs. Um, it's understanding what metadata is, um, not only so you can manage it yourself and, you know, utilize it, but also when you start trading documents with opposing counsel or partners, what kind of information is still in the document. Um, so that's the practice of law. And then there's the business of law. This is the part of the legal practice where you're managing uh, paralegals, you're handling the finances, you're doing client development. And it's also using technology to kind of bust up that model a little. Um, because you, you normally you have an office, you hang your shingle, and then the clients come to you. Well, what if you're comfortable enough with using technology that now you're, you have a, an online portal, some kind of online into automated intake things that you're, I need to do something about my father's estate and I'm just, you know, I'm just doing an internet search for a lawyer in Athens, Georgia estate. And I find someone, you know, and they have this like little tool. I'm like, okay, I'm not actually interacting. I'm not actually being charged with anything. This is great. So I put in this little tool and the software comes back and says, yeah, you would be perfect to contact this firm and that here's the form with all the information you've just entered, just trying to figure out how to manage the situation. And you've just accomplished 75% of the work of an, an initial meeting. So you're just shaved off three quarters of the initial price of that meeting, things like that. It's just now you're comfortable with that. So now you're offering video conferencing services to areas of rural Georgia or rural America in general. Uh, you're, now that you can kind of parcel out everything you do and you charted it out on your website, you can let people do an a la carte thing. I need 
probate service and I need someone to represent me during this this particular client. I don't need someone to work on the contract or the paperwork drafting. I can, I'm comfortable enough doing that myself. So now you're providing kind of like a smorgasbord of services and people can pick the ones they like and just discard the ones they don't. It's, you know, it's the model that people are getting really used to. And like, I don't want cable. I want Netflix and I want Hulu <laughs> and I want this, that, and the other thing, but I don't want that package. The people who are really comfortable with technology in the legal field are adapting that and they're enjoying some tremendous success. And also as part of your role here at the law school, you advise faculty on um, how to use technology in the classrooms Mm -hmm. and, and how are you helping them these days? A lot of the technology I talk about with faculty is how to translate the learning experience into something that can be transmitted or repackaged. So there's a lot of just, you know, video capture, audio capture, a lot of teleconferencing, actually. There were a couple instances in the past few years where we've had an adjunct faculty who just came to me or emailed me and said, I need to be back in New York City for the next week, but I'm supposed to be teaching a class on Friday. What can we do to help out? So I'm like, okay, we're going to move a tablet into the classroom. We're going to face the camera on the tablet towards the class. We're going to hook it up to a projector. So now we're doing a distance course. He's on his iPhone in New York on like the 37th floor of some building, and he's doing (laughs) FaceTime with us in Athens. Welcome to the future. This is great. (laughs) There's also just kind of the different kinds of technologies, the responses, you know, the clickers. They're kind of falling out of favor, but uh, survey technology in general has just or survey services. So like a Moodle survey monkey or I'm trying to think of there's just so many different ways to provide to allow students to provide feedbacks, to kind of provide examples, to kind of gauge how much understanding for a topic the students have. And it's all anonymous for the most part. So if you just really didn't get it, but you don't want to stick up your hand when it says, okay, who didn't get that? Well, I'm just going to tap on my iPhone a bit. And then so I'm like, okay, so, you know, three quarters of the class did not understand what just came out of me. So let's go over this again. (laughs) That kind of technology. And... I mean, it's very boring when you say it, but the, the the level of complexity when you really start getting into wanting to repackage a recording and live streaming it out to the world, it's fun. Very cool. You and the other law librarians just got back from some recent tech conferences, too. Can you tell us a little bit about those conferences, which ones you guys went to, and sort of uh, what were the big takeaways from those? Sure thing. So I think the most recent one was the Cali conference and law students might be familiar with Cali. They are the little cards that get stuck in your 1L uh, welcome package that promptly disappear from existence. Um, But Cali stands for the Computer Assisted Legal Instructions. So this is a conference for faculty members, for IT people, for librarians to just talk about education in law in the context of technology. So this year, we were in Phoenix in June. So that was a trip. <laughs> was uh, it very, very hot? It was. The, the Monday after the conference, it got so hot that planes couldn't fly. Like, Ugh. like apparently the engines just aren't engineered to handle those kinds of temperatures. Anyway, so the conference this year, the big thing was about distance education. It was, you know... The, Is the ABA going to or when is the ABA going to relax restrictions on how much of legal education can be done online or or over distance? How do you offer the brick and mortar experience to people who are doing an online course? Or how do you integrate lessons from online teaching into a normal class setting? So lots of flipping the classroom, which is a throwback to a trend from a couple of years ago anyway big thing about distance education. So, and I think the, one of the most compelling uh, arguments I heard was a point counterpoint presentation about is distance education fundamentally different from just education? Are there things you have to do as part of distance learning that are unique to that? Or are you just adapting certain pedagogical practices for this new format? And I know they were good arguments on both sides. What do you think? 
I he was really compelled by it's just education that the fundamentals of reaching out to students don't change whether you're doing it at like 18 inches from their face, you know, in a live physical setting, or if it is completely asynchronous, I am taking a course at UGA from Beijing, that if as long as you're applying the basics of, you know, good course design, coming up with good learning objectives, uh, creating assessment that provides meaningful feedback to students, sounds good to me. Cool. And the other conference, and this was the really exciting one for us because it was the ABA Tech Show. This is the trade show for lawyers who are in the know about technology. And uh, Maureen Cahill uh, attended it last year. And it was, I mean, it is almost entirely lawyers. There are no faculty. There are no deans. There are no librarians. There are no IT. Well, I mean, there's lots of IT people and lots of IT vendors, but now the academics are starting to kind of carve a niche out of this conference, which is really great because you can actually hear people on the ground talking about the technology they think is most useful and most exciting. So what, what were some of the, the things that you saw there? It was kind of, uh, and this is why I was getting so impassioned about that conversation before about here's all the cool things you can do in the practice law and the business of law. Mm -hmm. That's what they were getting really excited about. It was providing distance uh, consultation to people in rural and out of the way areas. It's how much of your firm services and uh, management can you outsource to people so you can, how much can you just get off of your plate so you can focus on exactly what you were trained to do. and But it really kind of comes back to how comfortable can you convince an attorney to be with technology because and this was the big tension that I think came out of that conference was you have services like Rocket Lawyer and Zoo, uh, Legal Zoom and all these, and they are op they were they're providing legal services, but they are not abiding by the same rules set forth by the American Bar Association, whereas lawyers have to. So what what does that look like? How do you convince a lawyer to embrace technology when technology is fighting them and taking their jobs? It's just like, no, mm. they are they are they are filling in the gap that you're not. You need to be using technology to be fighting air quotes fighting them in their own space, providing legal service to the I think it's like 80% of people who are not poor enough to get subsidized legal services or but aren't too rich to you can just throw money at an attorney. There is an enormous amount of the population who can be served if you just adapt your practice with some useful technology. So convincing people of that, that was the big takeaway. Very cool. Very cool. Another aspect of technology is how you serve law library resources to our, our patrons. Um, I know you've, you've been working on an app for the law library <laughs> are there would you like to tell us about that sure uh we do have a a law library app we call it alex it's the ed i forget what this, it, there is a very clever acronym behind alex uh it is it's for android it is for iphone so uh, get it on whatever your marketplace of choice is it provides um, the hours for the library, uh, quick access to all of our online databases, a search of the catalog, directions to the library, all sorts of convenient little things. We don't use it to push out advertisements or messages, so it's just a nice little thing to have to say, like, when is the library closing today? Oh, it's 2 a.m. Well, I need to find, I need to get to one of the research databases. I don't like, I can just use the apps it's a it's a it's a handy little thing we of course we're always subscribing and providing access to crazy great new databases that just have all sorts of good information and as soon as you just start digging into them like okay well what i thought was going to be an enormous project is now almost entirely done for me thank you library i wow. wish i wish <laughs> <laughs> i mean we've been talking about Using technology in law, what about law that, you know, relates to technology, like technology law? Is yeah. that something you feel comfortable speaking about? It's, or? It, I mean, yeah, I, I am. It's if, if only because it's really interesting to see how technology is pushing the boundaries of law and how law kind of like pushes back a little. I, 
I think it's the different mashups and the way big data is being used and how law has not really kept up. It has been completely interesting. Hmm. It's some of the stuff coming out of Uber, I'd say. Like they had some program that was capturing data from the their driver's phones that could tell them when these drivers were actually also working for Lyft, which is a competitor for Uber. So they were collecting all this data from, and I mean, they weren't actually like tapping into the Lyft information, but they could see that the driver would turn off their phone, turn off the Uber app, but still be driving around just like they were driving around doing the ride sharing things like, okay. And though people could say like, all right, they're doing both. Let's push special deal to the people who are do, who are doing both so we can make them do Uber even more. I'm like, that's a great application. Does Uber, does Lyft, can Lyft say anything about that? Are they misappropriating the data? Is that information, is that, where is that tucked into the end user license agreement in the Uber agreement? This is like all sorts of crazy fun things like that. So creative applications of big data and, you know, operating outside of the spheres of what people understand. That's really fun. And now we're starting to see, you know, military grade cyber weapons fall into civilian hands. And there was that massive ransomware back in June. Um, it's they actually a really prominent, very technologically savvy law firm was just hit by one of these ransomware tools. And I'm fairly sure that kind of falls under the context of existing laws, but there are going to be times when people or state actors, individuals, whatever you say, are start going to just start terrorizing the public with these things. And what is the response? What what is the what are the repercussions if you actually find these people? What do you, how do you rein that in? It's fascinating. Cool. And what would be some good? Um library resources or perhaps even classes that students could take if they were interested in that aspect of technology law. Sure thing. Um, we have access to a fantastic uh, new service uh, as part of the our subscription to uh, law.com. It is legaltech.com. It is, if you try, just try to get to that content anywhere else, you'll see lots of restrictions. You only see the first couple sentences. We have a full on subscription. So as long as you're here, you can see all of that great content. Um, there are just a lot of really nice blogs like Robert Ambrogi has a fantastic technology blog. Uh, law firms actually tend to have blogs that are trying to that are tracking trends in the law or their own services. So those kinds of things are great ways in terms of learning about this kind of stuff in classes. It, we bring it up a little bit in the legal research classes, the advanced legal research class. Of course, if you really want to get into it in the spring of 2018, Maureen and I will be teaching our legal technology class once again. So if any of this sounds even remotely interesting, please give that a shot. Sounds great. And before you go, uh, mm -hmm. we wanted to ask you to share one of your favorite technologies that you use on a personal level. It could be anything. <laughs> on a personal level, some of my favorite tech, and the most limited basis, I am still, I still love augmented reality technology. The just the the stupid transposition of a dumb Pokemon uh, for the Pokemon Go app. I just love. At augmented reality it's the projection of digital information into you know just your normal perception so like people have seen the microsoft hololens or the google glasses where just like the information shows up in the world i just think that's the greatest thing i've been so in love with this technology for the longest time and it's slowly inching towards being popular and kind of out there but not yet I don't know. This could be another one of those things that sounds really cool in practice, just never goes anywhere. But have you have you tried the Google Glasses or other other products like that? I there is there at the Cali conference. There's always one guy. There's a couple guys. There's always one guy who's walking around with Google Glasses. I just I'm like, dude, let me try them on. I'm like, never tried it. <laughs> I've done the virtual reality. I've done a couple of the different headsets, and those are rad. But you know. I want I want I you know I just want to be walking home, and then I want a little pop up in my like 
augmented reality headset to say, you know, you've just walked, you know, you've just hit your 6,000 steps. And here's this interesting historical fact about what you about the building you just walked by. And like, just imagine going to a new city you've never been to and seeing all that kind of cool info. It's just there's possibilities out there and we'll get there eventually. Oh, and I was just going to say quantum computing is going to become consumer grade in a couple of years. That is going to be the best. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is going to be the coolest. It sounds excellent. And all of our encryption will, will be. All of our encryption. <laughs> every single huge amount of encryption with things that would take computers until the heat death of the universe to solve will just be cracked instantaneously. Oh, my God. It's going to be a mess. I can't wait. <laughs> Well, thanks again for being with us, yeah, Jason. Sure thing. And now we're pleased to introduce Tina Whitehair. Tina is the assistant to the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. She serves as a staff representative on the law school's technology committee. And she has a degree in computer information systems. Tina, you're known as a good person to ask if somebody is having trouble with, you know, some program or system that you have to interact with. Could you tell us about some of the programs and websites that you use most often? As an assistant here, we mostly work a lot with the university systems, but we also do Microsoft Office a lot, which is where most of my questions come from. Other assistants who are not really familiar with it, especially when we switch to the new 2016. Things are in different places. We also have people who used to use WordPerfect, and they're very sad that we have do not have reveal codes anymore. <laughs> and so I kind of have to help them learn how to use Word. The check request system, which we do travel authorities and travel expense statements, that's something that we have to navigate as an assistant. The timekeeper system, Kronos, that we use is very confusing. It just has this weird way, like you'll put in your time and then it's like, I don't think you meant to do that. And it'll have these red boxes that ultimately scare everybody. It accepts your time, but it's like this giant red box is now there and the assistant's yeah. like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> no. they're like, Tina, help me. <laughs> and I still help people at this point in the Kronos system to enter their time mm. during the week. Uh, so... And so those are all like web applications that the university is in charge of. Yeah. And the letter request, the recommendation letter request system, Oscar, gives people some grief. So this is leading into the handbook. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions about the handbook. So uh, we know you maintain an employee handbook. And that includes some screen captures of some of the programs that you've already mentioned. This seems like a really great resource. Uh, was it your idea to create that or do you just maintain it? And can you tell us a little bit about what what types of people are using it and how they use it? Sure. It was my idea to make it. I thought it would be a really good resource, especially for new employees who came in and had not used any of the university systems. Mm -hmm. However, also I was spending a good deal of my day standing behind people, helping them troubleshoot these systems that we use every single day. Mm -hmm. It just seemed more advantageous and more efficient for me to, while I'm already in there, step by step by step, take photos, <laughs> highlight in boxes. This is where you click so that they'll know what to expect when they get to the next screen. And then that way I'm freed up to actually do my job. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an easier resource for them, too, that they can constantly keep and flip to each time. Because some of the things that we do, there's a lull. So right. you might not use that system for a while. Mm -hmm. So you can go back to that page, click on the link, and go look at just that section of the handbook. And then you have a step-by-step -step instruction awesome. sheet for how, it. How long is the handbook? Is this a pretty lengthy document we're talking about? And, and do you, does people have it in print? You print this out for people? Or? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, it has all of the... It used to have the EBB step-by-step -step instructions and for that our exam. Is, yeah, exactly. EBB <laughs> is stands for Electronic Blue Book. That was the exam software that we used to use, and that was... Um, a bit of a process for printing, but other than that, worked pretty great. But um, yeah, it it did work great. There were just several steps that you had to take: unzipping files, then opening them, and different things, downloading. 
And for some assistants, that was just a lot to keep up with. And every single time, Tina, help. I'm trying to print <laughs> these exams. And you only have to do it once a semester. So then you don't really remember. Right. Yes. 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 So that was one of the main things. Um, The Oscar recommendation system was also pretty intense if you hadn't done it before. So it was kind of a mix for people who had been here for a while to go back and get a refresher. But also I knew we had a couple new employees who were here and exam time was coming. And I was like, I don't think anyone has explained to them how the software works. So, (laughs) Well, thank you for being so awesome with that. Oh, thanks. (laughs) Along with the employee handbook, I also do the adjunct handbook, which is for all of our part-time professors who come. Some of them only one semester, but some of them are returning. And in there, we have things such as how to get started on your paperwork, what you need to do to prepare for class, how to print your class rolls, how to enter your grades, which is a very big one. So I think that was also a really... Because I had done the employee handbook, it got me in the the mindset of doing that of it would be so much easier for me not to have to answer questions from these 15 individuals over and over again. I can just create this handbook and even for technologically challenged people, which most of these people don't use university systems at all. I think it's come in really handy for them to have this. And we can also have the oh, if you look on page five of the handbook. There's a step-by-step instruction for how to do this. So yeah. Right. That was really handy. While we were on the subject of the um, exam software, we recently changed the software, right? When, when did we change that, exactly. Leslie? I know you, you're uh, extremely involved in the exam software. In the fall, we are now using ExamSoft, and that is the same software that the Georgia Bar uses. Um, so when students are taking their exams here, they're getting a, you know, an experience that's closer to what it'll be like to take the bar exam. And there's some other benefits to that software. I really, I have, I have a soft spot for, for EBB, but I, they're both, <laughs> they're both great. There's pros and cons. Yeah. How long did we use EBB before we switched to this software? Uh, I don't remember. I started in O2 and we were using ExamSoft and then we switched to EBB. And I think we did use that for maybe six years or it's been, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> you, got, you got a lot of time vested in yeah. but, EBB. But the law students, you know, they we, our main goal is to make the process easy for the law students because they're the ones that are stressed out. And then, we, but we also have to think about the the assistants who are dealing with printing all these hundreds of seventy page. Well, not that big, but, you know. Oh, yes, they are. You know, giant uh, documents. Um, anyway. How how much of a diff- of a change has that been? Have you seen a difference when we've since we've switched software? Are there less questions about printing? There are. Um, Excellent. I have found that the few people that I have asked and, and new people who just came in with the exam soft era haven't really had much of an issue. It's pretty much contained within the same system. So you just select all and print pretty much. I think that's probably the biggest change that's happened technologically at the law school since I've been here. I've been here seven years. And yeah. um, before your current position in the dean's office, you were the administrative assistant for several professors, um, what kinds of programs or, or websites do they need to use and how have you helped them over the years? Most of the professors are pretty self-sufficient when it comes to navigating whatever websites they need to get to on that level. Uh, however, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, those sorts of things come to us. There are a lot of things that they just don't deal with. They just, I need this magic to happen, and it go, comes down to the assistance. So those were the the ones that we were most asked to help with when they had some sort of project, and we would help them with that. Then there's the older professors who use no technology, and I was really excited to, I work with Professor Carlson, who writes multiple books on yellow legal pads, and I type them in, and I would do the same with his emails. So he is now successfully using an iPad to reply and compose his own email. So fantastic. He's 82. So he's doing great. You were the person that made this switch for him. You kind of convinced him to leap into the technological error. Yes. Yes. 
He does still use a fax machine at times, but <laughs> we're working on him. So That's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, he's That's come good. a long way since I first started here, so I'm pretty proud of him. Oh, uh, cool. What are some of the most common questions that you were asked about technology by other faculty or staff? What are the, the specific programs, I guess? Again, office, the office programs. I have had multiple questions formatting because, you know, Word loves to think it knows what you want to do <laughs> and say, oh, I think you were trying to do this. No, actually, I wasn't. <laughs> so I have a lot of people come to me and say, I've been working on this for like 30 minutes and it's just frustrating me. Can you help me with this? And formulas in Excel are a big thing I get questions about. A lot of the professors, um, Professor Burnett actually still calls me and is like, Excel goddess, I need your help with this. <laughs> um, something I know that you've showed me how to do before, but I can't remember. So, yeah. Um, those are pretty much the questions I get the most about are the the office questions. You mentioned already that the um, the change in exam software is probably the biggest change that you've seen in your time. Yes. Here, mm -hmm. um, are there any changes that you would like to see happen? Any improvements? Anything maybe we could do for you? I think there have also been really good changes to the portal that have been handy over the years, and you've always been very accommodating. When I was like, hmm wonder if we could do this. Um, and for those who don't may not know, the portal, or we call it sometimes My Georgia Law, is sort of a, a central um, place where you put functionality that needs you know to know who you are, basically. So you log in, and then it knows who you are, and then it can show you the things that you might need, hopefully, if we're doing our jobs. Maybe we so. can share a couple of the things that are there <laughs> that people who aren't students might not know. So like the student directory, for one, is, mm -hmm. is one that I've used before. What are some other things that, that get used in the uh, student portal? Um, as an assistant, we can log in as the professors to print their class roles. Uh, that's very handy. They love having the little pictures of their students before class. That's probably the main thing we, we go in there for on their behalf. Uh, we also have the anonymous numbers in there that become invaluable at exam time. So we can make sure we have all the exams, everybody's in. That functionality is amazing. You can also email the whole class from there. So you go into the professor's profile, choose the class, and it brings up all the students. And you can email all the students at once. So if you have an, any kind of message or assignment or attachment that you need to send out to the class. And this comes into play when a professor might need to cancel a class mm -hmm. or something like that. And we actually can send things on their behalf by going through the portal, which more often than not, we're the ones who send those messages. <laughs> so it's very handy. What are, are there some other features that you want to mention, Leslie? Or any that features added? that you would like? I know we, <laughs> we talked about one thing that I'm going to work on this summer. So sort of streamlining that switching to the professor's view. Oh, yes. But. I wasn't going to mention it. Oh, it's but good. that's it's the good. thing I've been I, dreaming I, of. I like to hear these things. <laughs> and and Tina's sort of in a special category because she also, you know, because of her IT background, she can edit web pages. She has more rights to different things in the portal than, than other admins do. So there's, you know, we can fine-tune this and... and give people the, you know, the tools that they need to, to better do their jobs. So. Yeah. Which is fantastic, yeah. especially since you guys have such a, a great rapport with each other. Yes. <laughs> the portal goddess is what I call Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> and you are the Excel goddess. <laughs> <laughs> Before you go, we have one more question for you. What is your personal favorite new technology or just any kind of technology that you enjoy using? It doesn't even have to be something that you use at work. I think right now my current technology, and it's not a new technology by any means, but new to me is I discovered Hulu recently. So <laughs> um, there's a wealth of things on there that I enjoy and I've been having fun exploring on there. And uh, actually a coworker got me um, hooked onto a show. And then from there, I started spiraling down <laughs> the Hulu rabbit hole of finding all the great shows. Yeah. That And there's some older things on there that I remember watching as a kid that I'm rediscovering now and what are some of your favorite things that you're you're watching the show that the coworker introduced me to was The Handmaid's Tale which is also a great book if you haven't read it so that's what got me 
that was your starting point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where I ventured out. Um, I also watch a lot of crime dramas. I have a great love for investigation discovery and watching all those. And I found that you can choose a network and there are various shows from that specific network. So I've been very excited to pick up some of my investigation discovery shows that I used to watch that I've missed. That was like my one channel I watched when I had cable. I was sad (laughs) to let it go. So now I'm like, Joe Kenda is back. (laughs) The streaming services are are really taking taking off. I Mm -hmm. mean, again, like you said, it's not it's not a new thing, but it seems to really be rapidly replacing how people do um, do cable. I mean, I, I, I haven't had cable in like 10 years. Yeah. And. I was just doing without it for a really long time. But very recently, like within the past few months, we've started using um, just Amazon Prime Video mm-hmm. and added the Showtime channel. And and I've also added like a Filmstruck the, so that I can have the Criterion Collection channel so we can watch a lot of films. Mm-hmm. And that's like that's the new way to do it. You yeah. know, there's so much on there that you can't get anywhere else. And a yeah. lot of stuff that you you certainly wouldn't be able to watch on, you know, regular cable right. for a higher cost (laughs) and like you said for those channels that you like you can add them on individually and so you kind of get to pick your package whereas i feel like with cable you have a thousand channels and you watch maybe five of them so well thank you so much for talking with us tina oh Um, thanks for having me it's been fun We have Brad Grove joining us in the studio now. Brad is the help desk manager for IT services, which means he's the one who answers the majority of the phone calls and emails to the help desk. He also maintains all the computers in the law school and helps all the students who walk into the office having trouble with their laptops. So Brad, what are some of the most common issues that you help folks with? Everybody complains about a slow computer. Everybody thinks their computer's slow. What I get from students Mostly, it's connecting to pause. Mm-hmm. The wireless network. That's the most common. Sometimes they come in and I think they have a virus or the computer's slow, and I'm willing to help with that. Officially, we kind of don't support that, but if I'm, we probably even shouldn't say that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we can, can remove because officially. officially we I don't, don't support that. What what, what do just, we support officially? We support the software that we put on their computers, okay. like ExamSoft. Okay. Or, yeah, it's exams off now. How about Microsoft Office Suite that the university gives us? That would be EITS's domain, and I'm not sure how much help you would get from them with an actual Microsoft product, but you can call them. And how about for um, staff? Slow computers. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and, you know, stuff breaks all the time. People download things they're not supposed to and install them. And that slows it down and have to install uninstall something. But yeah, I mean, and things do break. Computers do crash. So it's a grab bag. Printing. I imagine faculty deal with printing also, right? Oh, yeah. They tend to be more, more stable as far as their computers go. Because they don't ask a lot of their computers. Most of them. It's word perfect or word. <laughs> what are some of the more unusual problems that you've dealt with? I couldn't come up with any. (laughs) We we work in a professional environment. There aren't raccoons or children sticking cheeseburgers in anything. (laughs) That doesn't happen here. Do you enjoy the process of troubleshooting and solving some of these mysteries? Could Could you tell us of one of the common things that you troubleshoot? I do like it. It can be a rabbit hole. Because your second decision can be the path that leads you down 10 more steps when you should have turned left way back Mm -hmm. when, Mm -hmm. which gets frustrating and to the point where you want to throw something. But once you come out the other side and you fixed it, you don't care anymore. All that anger just goes right away. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's temporary. (laughs) This is going to come off as very cynical. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. You're, You're known for being a very calm person, and I think this is part of what helps you do this job successfully and deal with people who are in various states of panic and uh, aggravation. Um, What advice would you have for the rest of us for staying calm when our computer goes haywire? I think 
people make the mistake of thinking when their computer is broken, the entire computer is broken, it's all gone. And that's usually not the case. It's a component, and that comp component is almost never the hard drive. Sometimes it is, but that hard drive is where your files live. So the first thing you should be aware of is your stuff is probably still there 70, 75% of the time. So that's not what you're worried about, getting your files back. They're probably living there quite safely. They can be easily retrieved. It just becomes a matter of fixing the computer itself. And that's money, not loss of entire semester of notes. Although you should be backing up. And if you want to back up, you can use OneDrive provided by the university. There's more space than you can ever fill. Dropbox, if you like that. Not as much space, but if you're just wor worried about saving documents, there's plenty there for that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, OneDrive, is, it's so massive. That's what you'd recommend for students? Sure, or if they're more comfortable, Dropbox. Again, yeah. it's really your documents you should be worried about if you're in law school. Not necessarily the pictures and the videos and all the other stuff. <laughs> you can back those somewhere else, like a portable hard drive. What kind of things do you do behind the scenes to keep all of the law school's com computers running well? Boring stuff like updates. Yeah. But updates are important because we had that big ransomware scare like two months ago. Yeah. If your computer was updated, that wasn't your problem because that, that had been patched with Microsoft months before, which why it wasn't a problem here because we're all updated. So we didn't have to worry about that. So... I think most students, probably because most students have laptops, and it's not the same as updating a desktop where you can just leave it, it's plugged in, it updates itself. You kind of mm -hmm. have to make an effort with a laptop. It's not out all night. Mm -hmm. You have to like not use it while it's updating, which is kind of a hassle, but it's still worth doing because you're going to get protected mm -hmm. from something. It's somewhere down the line that you even know about. So... Updates. That's what we do, and that's the most important part. One of the newest things that you're helping to support uh, in the law school is the use of Zoom. Can you tell us a little bit about that, um, what it is for people that may not know, and uh, the ways in which it's being used in the law school? It's like Skype, like FaceTime, simpler though, and you can do screen sharing. It's got a really simplified front end, which makes it perfect for long distance education. Because setup on the student's end is really quick, short. They get a link. They click on it. It installs a little client, and you're up and running. We've had it running for two, two summer semesters now, and we've had very little issue with it. Uh, mostly it's just connectivity where the student happens to be because they're most usually on laptops, sometimes from coffee shops. But that's kind of an environmental issue that you can fix by just being careful about where you take your classes. Mm -hmm. Probably not Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> so Brad, you've, you've been here with the law school for about 10 years now, is that right? Yes. And over those years, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the technology that we have? Everything's better now. Like literally. When I got here, there were still Pentiums around. It was not uncommon for a computer to take 20 minutes to boot. Everybody's computer was slow. Everybody had Windows XP, and Windows XP broke all the time. Mm -hmm. Windows XP would be kneecapped by viruses all the time. So I spent a lot of time reinstalling Windows on machines that had been taken down by a virus or simply mm -hmm. failed for some other reason. So nobody was ever really happy because nobody ever really had a fast computer. It just didn't exist yet. But then you know, now even our, our worst computer is not bad. The baseline of the, the hardware has come up to the point where it can handle pretty much anything. It's sort of gravy at this point, although some people just adjust their expectations to the point where they want it faster and faster. And Windows 7 helped a lot. It was far more stable than XP, far more resistant to viruses. Windows 10, which we're starting to move to even more so, and is faster. For instance, the ra ransomware issue did not hit Windows 10. It was not vulnerable to it. So, yeah, that's the biggest change is how much time I have spent dealing with broken software, broken equipment. Mm -hmm. It's gone way down. And there there used to be 
maybe one professor who had a Mac? What what is it like these days? What percentage? There's a few more. It's still as far as the professors go, probably twenty, twenty five percent. Okay. It's up to them. Mm-hmm. I prefer Windows, but some people like their Macs. Mm -hmm. On the student end, have you seen a huge increase? Yeah. It's half and half now, probably, if not tilting Mac-wise. That's that's a big change from when we started out. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I get it. You know, they're easy. Yeah. And if you're going to do bright papers and surf the internet and do this, that kind of thing, then it's a nice, solid computer that is more or less trouble free so it sounds like the the computers and the um, operating systems have gotten better over the years what are some what are some changes that you'd like to see happen with our systems or, or the software that we use here at the law school the only thing I could go <laughs> I didn't come up with anything for this that's okay other than edu bots to replace all the professors <laughs> I don't think we can say that. And edgy robots. staff to replace all the staff. Robots. Okay. And they're like AI legal software now. Maybe we could become a campus just for AIs. It would just be me and the robots. Really efficient. You ever see that Bruce Dern movie? It's just him and the robots? I don't think so. And they're like on a spaceship, tending no. plants and stuff? No. He's all by himself. What's that called? I, have I don't to know. It. Yeah, I meant to look it up when it popped into my head. It's a younger Bruce Stern, and he's got two little helper bots, one of which dies. It's very sad. And for our last (laughs) question, um, we would love to know what your current favorite technology is. We've been asking everybody uh, on this episode this question, and it can be anything. It could be software, hardware, just something you use on on a personal level. What's your favorite sort of new technology to play around with? What do other people say? (laughs) I'm curious. Oh, it looks like we're getting a we're getting a help desk phone call. IT services, Brad. All right. So our last question <laughs> is: um, What is your favorite current technology that you enjoy using? Can you tell us a little bit about it? VR. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, as you know, because I brought it in, I brought a HTC Vive in for everybody to play with. It's first generation. It's wonky. Everybody would be better served to wait, but I couldn't, so I bought it anyway. Uh, it's fun. It's an expensive novelty, but there's so much potential that you can see just using it. And I think the second generation is going to be amazing. Third generation, even more so. Once it gets it, because it's like a scuba mask now. It's like going scuba diving wearing it. Your eyes sweat, and the resolution's pretty good. But even now, the horsepower isn't really quite there to run it. They'll say it is, but it's really kind of not, because it takes a lot. But by next year, I would think the next generation of graphics cards, which you'll see next year, combined with maybe a second Rift or 5 next year, maybe late next year, I think, I've heard will be pretty exciting stuff for entertainment, education, all kinds of stuff. That was really fantastic when you brought in the the VR and we had all the law school and library staff kind of come together and try it out. I know I had never done it before and I was really blown away. I did a, I don't remember what the game was called that, that I played. There was one where it was kind of underwater and that was great and calming and relaxing, but the, the one that was like zombie attack or something <laughs> well, it wasn't called zombie attack. No, no but, but there were zombies attacking me. There were. And that was very intense and very realistic. I mean, I didn't think that it was going to be that um, sort of engaging. Immersive. Yeah. And I I was definitely making a fool of myself, I'm sure, like screaming and jumping up and down. <laughs> I think everyone was. <laughs> I think but everyone it was really was. fun. It was a really mm-hmm. fun experience. So we, we've got to do that again. Do you have plans to... We can do it anytime. Well, thanks again for talking with us, Brad. And thanks for all you do for the law school. Sure. (laughs) 
We have three voices in the studio with us now. Professor Christian Turner, who's been teaching here at the University of Georgia School of Law for 10 years. He studies and teaches legal theory and property law. And this summer, he is going boldly where no professor has gone before by teaching a law school class for undergrads called the Foundations of American Law. Welcome, Professor Turner. Thanks. Hi. And we also have Jim Henneberger with us, who is our Director of Information Technology. He represents the law school as a member of UGA's IT Management Forum, and he keeps all our servers running so that Rachel and I can make websites. Welcome, Jim. Hello. And today we're also handing a microphone to our audio engineer, Lucas Carver. Lucas is a UGA student majoring in entertainment and media studies with a minor in studio art and film studies. He also hosts his own talk show on WUOG, the university's student-run radio station. Hey, Lucas. Howdy. It's it's fun being behind the mic. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, all of you. Uh, Christian and Jim want to ask you a question first. You've worked together over the last year to win the grant that funded the creation of the studio. Christian, could you tell us a little about that process and what inspired it? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I've done a podcast with a colleague of mine here at the law school for a while and have noticed increasingly that at lots of schools, law schools and otherwise, students are getting into you know, doing whatever it is that they do using all kinds of new media. And at the law school, traditionally, our medium has been paper. And and uh, and I guess within a, a few decades to uh, word processors. And But it's always been the written word. But increasingly now, there are legal podcasts. There are, uh, um, you know, there are videos. There are blogs. That law firms use um, blogs and other tools to communicate. And so the the kind of the range of legal communication has increased over the years, and we didn't have at the law school the facility to really do an excellent job helping students produce best of breed materials using those media. And I guess just at the right time, Jim, you can jump in. But this grant opportunity from the University of Georgia, yes. uh, the Center of Teaching and Learning, uh, offered up a, a, a grant opportunity to. It was a one time funding for special projects. Yeah. So. That would enhance student learning in particular mm -hmm. ways that, that I thought that this grant fit quite well. And not only that, not only would it help our students produce such materials, but it would also help our efforts in the law school to produce excellent materials for distance learning, online learning, and the like. So it was a, it was a good mix of uh, circumstances yes. coming together at the right time. It worked out for sure. Yeah. And Jim, could you tell us more about who is currently using the studio and who might use it in the future and how one goes about booking recording time? Sure. Yeah. Right now we're doing mostly a testing phase. Um, right now we have Christian. He's doing a podcast here and one or two of the librarians have done that. But right now we're just waiting for people to start using it. We feel like it's meant for students primarily. And uh, of course, faculty and staff are welcome. And they can find the website uh, to schedule the room on our web page. And so Lucas is our expert on the equipment and the software in this room. Could you tell us a bit about what we have here? And um, are you available to help people with their recording projects? Well, as far as what's here, how dorky do you want me to get? <laughs> Let's go all out dorky. <laughs> all right. So we have a Universal Audio uh, Apollo 8. Uh, it's just it's basically the interface that we hook the mics into and it talks to the computer and tells the computer, hey, this is what we're recording. We have four really great dynamic microphones that are kind of the industry standard for podcasts radio alike, and they make you sound silky smooth, uh, especially Jim for some reason. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so smooth. You too can have that Jim, <laughs> that Jim <laughs> sound. Jim's going to play some smooth jazz. And <laughs> get, get the Henneberger sound. That's anyway, right, that's it. Um, and we also have a fully powered iMac with a lovely 27-inch retina display screen um, and a bevy of different audio editing programs. Right now we're using Logic Pro, which is Apple's kind of mid-tier audio source, but we also uh, just put the Adobe Creative Suite on there. So we have like Audition, Premiere, Photoshop, all that stuff. And yeah, if you ever have an idea for a podcast or a radio show, uh, I'm here to help. We also have this setup where professors and teachers can record uh, things for distance learning, the really solid Yeti condenser microphone, um, and a bunch of programs that you can basically film your lectures or your PowerPoints and send them to your students. And we got a really nice camera in here too, and a keyboard. 
Yes, we do. We we have a MIDI keyboard. If you need podcast intro music, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> or sound effects, right? Or sound effects, yes. Yeah. Or sound effects. Mm-hmm. This space is meant for students in like increasingly like clouded markets. Special skills like being able to use new media to kind of get your ideas across can really help you stand out. So learning how to do a podcast, even though that's may not be what you're going to do in life, it's it's a good skill to have. And yeah, I'm here four days a week able to help you and do anything you need. I, I think given current trends, this will be what you do with your life. Everyone eventually will be, will have a show. That's yes. just how it's going to go, right? That's true. Yeah. And Lucas, where can we hear you on the radio dial? Um, well, I host a video game talk show on WUOG called Super Chap Bros. Uh, it's been around for like a decade now, um, but I took the reins a couple years ago. I'm not doing anything in the summer now because uh, two of our people aren't in town, but we'll be back fall semester, and you can find any information about that on at WUOG.org in the programming guide. Christian, I'll go back to you. Uh, when and how did you first get into podcasting? Well, I, we started the show in, at, in December 2013, I think, um, and I'd been listening, like, like a lot of people, when I think it was 2001 when the first iPod came out. and That sounds right. Yeah, and you could sync it with iTunes and actually wrote a little program then that would, uh, that would launch your computer and use the kind of onboard um, uh, some software to record streaming audio. Because you remember in those days how everybody had like real player and there was all this mm. garbage. <laughs> like, yes. You know, and you had to sit and be at the computer and you had to use the right software. So I wanted all of that. Like I wanted all those NPR shows on my iPod to take with me. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a little application that would do that. And this was... Um, Around the same time that I think it was Adam Curry that got going with podcasting. Do you remember this the, in the early days? I think I remember yeah, Adam see, Curry. Yeah, showing my age. Yeah, no, but, but there were there were early podcasts, which again you kind of would sync to iTunes, and then you would sync your iPod with iTunes, and you mm-hmm. take it with you. You know, so I'd listen to a few of those, but I was never that into it. And and then the phone came, right? And once the phone is there, and people are syncing podcasts with their phones. Then it was clear it was really going to take off. And I listened to a number of podcasts, usually on tech issues, pretty early on, maybe 2010, 2011, maybe, maybe even before then, maybe it was like 2007 and later, um, and really got into it and then got the idea that I could do this myself. You know, it, it's really cheap to get into. It doesn't cost very much. Um, kind of the more you spend, the less sweat you have to put into it, but yeah, you know, if you're willing to put the time into it, you can, you can do it for, for pretty cheap. So yeah. Or it's like the production triangle. Uh, it's like, uh, it's like, it, it can be a uh, cheap, uh, it's like quality time or cost pick two. Right. Yep. That's there you about go. it. Yep. Yeah. It can, it can be cheap and good, but it's not gonna, it's gonna take a lot of time. It can take a lot of time and be good, but it won't be cheap. Yeah. I don't know if we ever quite, you know, we, we try to aim for good. I don't know if we ever get there. <laughs> We, we get we, there. It's certainly cheap. And no, yeah. I, well, in the studio, of course. Yeah. I'm talking about my, my oh, own stuff. Oh, yeah, okay. no, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think it, you can qualify that as good, right? <laughs> I leave that for others. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the way I think about it is, um, you can put in a little bit of effort with, uh, especially podcasting, and get like a really as long as you have good content, it'll stand out. But that little like extra 10% of quality will really make you stand out. And that's kind of what I feel like this space does. It gives students and teachers that extra 10% to make them stand out and make really good quality stuff. Yep. Yeah, I think things sound really great in here as well. Speaking of what has been recorded in here, you've already mentioned a little bit about your podcast oral argument. Can you tell us what the goal of that podcast is for other people who may be listening and aren't familiar with it already? Boy, what is the goal of that? I mean, it's uh, so this is a show that I do with Joe Miller, who's a colleague here. And, you know, we, we had the idea that, that like there are lots of great ideas out there, you know, in, in the legal academy. And there are kind of lots of ideas that would be accessible to people from all walks of life, whether they're students in, in law or undergraduate students or practicing lawyers or people who just are interested in this stuff because, you know, law is kind of the software that society runs on, right? I mean, it is the the engine for deciding stuff that we have to decide. And it's people take a, you know, a great interest in at least kind of the hot button issues. But we thought that there was a, a space for people who wanted to go further to hear what made law interesting, at least to us. So the kind of thing that sometimes you would see in a law school faculty colloquium, we wanted to bring that sort of thing to a, to a larger audience, but also make it more conversational, less of a presentation and then question, question, question. And let's just, let's just sit down and, and talk about stuff. And I and my friends and 
both here and at other schools, you know, we'll sit around the dinner table and talk about stuff and it can get pretty rambunctious in a, in a nerdy way. Of course, there's no other way that I probably get rambunctious, but, uh, and, and this was always fun. Like we always had a great time doing it. And so we sometimes having been immersed in kind of tech podcasts at that point, I'm like, boy, if we were recording this, like I might want to listen back. Um, especially when my friends were saying interesting things. And, and so that was kind of the conceit of the show is to, to bring that kind of conversation, the, which is, I think the best podcasts are the ones where it's like just people talking. You're like, boy, I'm glad I'm in on that conversation. Like, this is the kind of conversation I like to be in on. I mean, you want to talk back to it sometimes. And so we kind of aim to do that with legal ideas. What, what number of episodes are you guys up to now? Uh, I think we just shipped. Well, I, I know because I just shipped it before I came in here. I think it's 137, but maybe 138 because we had an episode zero. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah, I mean, it is, you know, it's, it's, we're coming up on four years and we do mm-hmm. it not every week because we just kind of randomly will declare a hiatus. Like, we're not going to ship an episode next week, but, you know, yeah, it's a good number. It's fantastic. <laughs> what advice do you have for students and others who might be thinking of starting their own podcast? And are there any good tech podcasts that you can recommend? Hmm, advice. You know, I, I think you do want to make it sound good. You want to have some pride in your craft. Just to remember, you know, if you put a minute into making something sound a lot better and you multiply it by the number of people who listen, that's like you're conferring a lot of advantage to other people by putting in a little bit of time. But the most important thing, because I listen to some shows that are that sound terrible, mm-hmm. but I can, but I love them. Like the Flop House podcast mm-hmm. uh, is a fantastic kind of comedy mo- movie podcast. And half the time, something goes wrong, and they basically the recording off of someone's laptop speaker that's happened a few times, but I still love it. So it's just like, is it an authentic conversation? Like, are people actually talking to each other? I mean, is, so I think you kind of have to forget that the mics are there. You just kind of have to talk. And, and at first you may get the urge to kind of go back in and edit that out and make it like, let's get to the point, get to the point. But maybe people don't really want that. People kind of like, you know, hearing the conversation unfold. And, you know, I'll go through and I'll take out things that go kind of too far off the rails. Maybe if I have a guest with a lot of ums and ahs, like I sometimes do, I'll take some of those out just to try to make the guest uh, sound better. And and remembering, of course, that people are listening and you want to respect their time and you want to give them a sense of the conversation uh, without, you know, like what I'm doing now, which is kind of just going off the rails and spinning off into whatever. (laughs) But But I mean, the thing I think about, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, that's, see, this is what you need. You got to have interruption. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because The thing that really separates podcasts from like traditional like audio radio, I think is like, I mean, it's a very, it's more personal. And because like in the old days when you would listen to the radio, like it was heavily compressed and like you had that really boomy, like voice of God. But like, I think with podcasting, it stands apart because it's, it, it is more personal. It's more conversational. And I think the more genuine you are and the more that you think about trying to like basing your content off of human interaction, the better it'll be. So it's really about just being genuine and having a good idea. Because um, no matter how bad it sounds, if you have a good idea, people will love it. Yeah, if people want to be in on it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's you know that that's a thing. And then the second question was about tech podcasts or just podcasts or in general. Any, any of your favorite podcasts, yes. and, and this goes for you too, Jim. I'm sorry. The closest, <laughs> the closest thing that I listen to is Radio Lab, and that's close to a podcast, but it's, it's more like, old school. Radio Lab radio. is great, mm-hmm. and and it is a good you know it's it's in that genre of podcast, which is more like the radio program taken mm-hmm. over onto the new medium. Um, but that's, you can do that kind of show. Uh, that's the kind of show that, that yeah. people listening could do, you know, maybe shorter, um, and maybe a different kind of content. Cause you don't have, you know, this made up your career, yeah. but if you want to produce a short, highly right. produced thing, the mm-hmm. tools are out there. You can do it if you put in yeah. the time. I really like invisibilia too. In yeah, that that's, same, a, that's a really good one mm-hmm. in, in that same genre. Um, and I've listened to, and in tech, I've listened to John Gruber's talk show for a long time now. That was one of the first I listened to. And I listen to Accidental Tech Podcast. Uh, I started listening to the McElroy Brothers. You listen to the McElroy Brothers? Oh, I my love, brother, my brother. I, I, lo- I love the mm-hmm. McElroy Brothers. Oh my god, it's really good. Do you, do you listen to the Adventure Zone? Yeah, yeah. They have uh, Griffin has this one. It's called Cool Games Inc. And it's yeah. basically him and his friend Nick Robinson. And people on Reddit send them names of like hypothetical video games, but they're always ridiculous. Like, yeah. there's one episode that came up with a script of that's a version of the Prestige, but just with a goose in it. <laughs> it's called the Prestige Goose. <laughs> It's hilarious. It's, it's great. It's, they, it's, and it's just the force of personality. Like you're like, exactly. I would, if I could, you know, if I could hang out with those guys for the evening, yeah. that would be a lot of fun. Right. Yeah. Um, for, for me, not for them. They'd be like, who's this guy? They'd be like, get, get, get out of here. But you know, they, they're, they're hilarious. And so I like that. I like the flop house. 
Uh, what else? I'm, uh, and then I listen to a number of like space podcasts. I'm really into um, like space flight now. Oh. So there's one called Orbital Mechanics that I like listening to. Jeez. There's one. Um, and then there's a Planetary Society, which has a more scripted like interview style mm. thing. I listen to that just for news. I'm trying to think of what else shows up in my... You know, when you got your podcast app and like it'll show up and you're like, oh, good. I've got, that's like an hour. That's going to be fun. And I usually, mm. what, do you, do you guys listen at 1X? This is a big debate that Joe and I have. No. You, what do you, what, what do you listen to? How do, how do you listen? Uh, how do I listen? How do I listen to podcasts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What um, speed? What speed? Oh, um, I will listen to it at 2X if I want to know. Wait, people listen to podcasts at different speeds? Yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. What if you, you just want the information, I mean, it's it's used a lot for lectures too. I mean, that's more for what it's used for. You're just looking for the information. You can listen to I, it I in guess half I, the time. I don't know. Like, there's, it just, it, I can't imagine doing that. Like, I, I was a purist one. I I remember when I was mm-hmm. when I was like you, Lucas. I remember those days when I was a purist <laughs> about this. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, the first like couple years of podcasts uh, that when. This this new age, this uh, a podcast when uh, the phone made it a, a new kind of thing, and I was really a purist about it, like because I listened to some podcasts where people cared a lot about audio quality, and mm-hmm. and they had this kind of goofy attachment to One X, which was partly you know tongue in cheek, but like that's no way to live. You can, if you want to listen to a bunch of podcasts, you can't possibly listen to them all at One X. No, I mean, unless you have a like a I mean, stupid commute or something, you can. Yeah, yeah. Or, I'm a, I'm a big two Xer. Yeah, I'm a big two Xer. Although the latest. Um, version of Overcast has now a 3x feature. Did you see this? Yeah, that's, you can't listen to that. I don't. I've been trying. This is fantastic news. I had no idea that people were listening to them at greater speeds. So if you go to the little interface, right, where it's got the little tick marks, and and you can kind of ratchet it up. Just try this. Just so ratchet it up one notch. Listen for a while. Suddenly it'll sound natural, right? Mm-hmm. You ratchet it up another and another, and over time, yeah, eventually you'll end up uh, like 2x or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then if you if you are used to that. And you say, I wonder what it sounds like at 1X. You take it back down to 1X and you're like, oh my God, people sound so stupid. <laughs> like, yeah. like this sound, this, like you. I can't, I can't, my own podcast, if I don't listen to it at more than 2X, I'm like, I, I just want to scratch my eyes out. I, I like mean, th- this sounds like the premise of a Black Mirror episode. You just keep going faster and <laughs> faster right, right. and faster. And then yeah. like, that's and right. then, and then we're uh, approaching the singularity, Lucas. <laughs> we're approaching the singularity, and then right. Rod Serling will come out of the door and say, "And this, and this is how society ended." When we get to infinite speed, there'll be no need to listen to podcasts anymore. You'll have all the information, right? It's falling into the black hole of mm-hmm. of information. <sighs> it works. I'm John. Jim, could you possibly listen at one X at this point? Uh, not to podcasts. I like radio. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but like like Radio Lab. It's I wouldn't speed that up. And it's not like I could. It's not like I listen to my music at two X. Right. <laughs> right. But it's then we'll the, get to that. How do you differentiate between? Well, it's about whether it's information or not. And sometimes, yeah. You know, so if it's a, mainly about information, then of course it's got to be faster. Because mm-hmm. if it's only about the information, if yeah. it's comedy and about timing. It's a little trickier, yeah. but but even that, like I listen to the flop house at close to two x. Really? And when I listen to it at one x, it's like the timing sounds off now. Like your brain adjusts. It really like the brain is an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. Speaking of invisibilia and Radio Lab, right? I mean, you listen yeah. to these things, you some of those things will just blow your mind, right? But the way the brain good. works, it just gets used to the speed at which you listen. Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. this makes me less patient with everybody else in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain know. is acting so much faster no, than everyone else. No, it's not that. Maybe it's acting more superficially. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I could handle listening, but it's something that I'm definitely going to try. Try, try a, not, you, a notch now a that week. You've mentioned I'm, it. A notch I'm not a week. I'm not going to give in to it. I'm, <laughs> You're holding steady. I'm a purist. I, I I stick to my values. I admire it. <laughs> well, thank you all for being with us today and for your dedication to the to the medium. And um, we'd like to ask everyone: What is your current favorite new technology this could be hardware software anything you'd like to talk about well since jim and christian are looking a little befuddled um it's not really a technology but it's just like a form of software i'm really big into comic books that's kind of been always one of my things since i was a kid there was this problem with like comic books of like trying to make them go to the digital space especially for like smartphones you just like scan a piece of paper and then it goes into your phone but the scale's not right there's this really great comic I found called uh, Phalina, P-H-A-L-L-A-I-N-A. And it's by this uh, French cartoonist and like a software company. And it's actually designed specifically for phones. 
um, and you hold your phone like horizontally and you just scroll to the left and there are no panel breaks, there's no page breaks, you just keep going and like all the images go together and flow together and there's like audio design and like scrolling. It's like, it's really fascinating. It it won a Peabody Award uh, this past month and it definitely deserves it. That's my Very big thing. Very cool. Very That's, cool. Thanks for sharing yes. that with us. That's an actual considered answer that yeah. is directly addressed to the mm-hmm. question asked. I, yeah. I mean, I read the email. I, <laughs> <laughs> I read it too, but I didn't. Um, I still don't know. I still I don't have an it. answer to this. I didn't read it at Do you, all. What, what's your favorite technology right now? Like Joe? I said, LED lights, man. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with LED lights. <laughs> no, I, I, will, I will say all the. No, LED lights are great. Ball, yeah. I thought you were going to say ball bearings. No, this no. This is going to be a Fletch <laughs> With the lever and the screw, that's the best technology, right? No, no. It's LED lights, man. I don't know. You know, WWDC is next week, the big World Apple Worldwide Developer Conference. So there'll be new stuff there, and it'll be interesting. And it's like uh, these days I'm kind of interested in these, um, in, in these, um, you know, these smart connected devices, the Amazon one and the Google one. I'm not going to oh, say yeah. the names. Otherwise, it'll trigger them. Have you you got to use a euphemism when you talk about them? That's Other, right, yeah. yeah. So I had a friend who did that. Mostly we used it to try to play embarrassing music at his house. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That reminds me of a story, but I won't tell it right now. Um, so, so I'm kind of interested with, with whether Apple does anything with that next week, and then how the other companies respond. Because I think the AI in the house is kind of a cool thing to to watch. I'm not, you know, we have one. Of, do you have one? Anybody else have one of those? Because uh, we we bought like the twenty dollar Amazon no. hockey puck thing. Hooked yeah, it up to a speaker. I don't know what you're talking about? It's pretty darn cool, really. Um, it it because you can get it to you know, play music and play radio. Mm-hmm. It's 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 almost worth it just to control the radio so I don't have to turn the thing on and off. You can just say play NPR, play WBR, hmm. BUR, and it'll just do it. It's you order cool. cat food with it? I'm Yeah, if you want to spend money, it will definitely enable I mean, but, that. I mean, but you have to buy like a pallet of it and it, they have to yeah, like ship true. it. Yeah, they have to just like <laughs> ship it directly to your door. I don't know, man. I don't know if I could do that. But I'm mainly interested, I'm mainly interested in space stuff these days. The, I'm interested in, in what, um, in SpaceX's Falcon Heavy. The, the big three booster thing oh, that's really? getting they're gonna send they're supposedly they're gonna send a private citizen to the uh in an orbit past the moon in at, by the end of 2018 have you Why? heard this no I that would be that. really amazing have you seen their video for their inner planetary transport system I, I i think there's someone i know of who like was one of the per, one of the people that they picked for it some like game designer i forget his name or forget, forget who it was oh, but who's, yeah. who's booked the moon thing yeah or not the moon thing i think they're like the interplanetary oh, one okay where yeah. they like go up into like the atmosphere and they start floating around oh yeah that's uh that, that, that's when you um okay yeah that's i think that maybe blue origin yeah which maybe. is uh jeff bezos's com- uh company his hmm. space company like every Every tech person has a space company these days. So. Yeah, it's true. Naturally. Yeah. So anyway, I'm looking Why forward not? to that stuff. I think it's really cool. I watch all these launches. You can watch them on Twitch now, you know? Oh, really? <laughs> they do yeah. Twitch for launches. Okay. Yeah, it's between that between Bob Ross and yeah, space Bob launches. Ross. That's like the best part of Twitch. Is it still doing it? Are they still doing Bob Ross on yeah, Twitch? Yeah, they still have Bob Ross. Okay. Check him out. Yeah. They have Mr. Rogers on there now, too, though. Good. Did Would PBS you? just make a deal with Twitch? And like now it's it's just fair game or... I think they just made a deal for Mr. Rogers. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I haven't read about it. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. But do we want to, should we, should we pause and find out definitively so we can provide that information sure. to the listeners? I don't know. I feel like we should reel it in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if this was, if, like, I feel, I feel like we were supposed to go to Peru and we're on, we ended up in Siberia. That's how... I think y'all, the, the three of you need your own podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think this is, this is fascinating conversation. Mm-hmm. It's, it's taken off even more than we could have hoped for. <laughs> Time, time to land it. Time to bring yes. it on home. Perfect. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, all three of you, for being here. Cool. If, Thank you, guys. This welcome. is awesome. Yep. If you can hold a conversation, you can have a podcast. It's true. <laughs> Even if you can't. <laughs> it's worked for me.